The president was interviewed by Fox News host Chris Wallace in an interview that aired yesterday, and it is unlike anything that I've ever seen. And I want to spend some time today looking at it with you. And it's really the stuff of history. I mean, this is an interview that needs to be analyzed really like that infamous is a Pruder film because the English language is stretched to its limit to even explain and describe what took place during this interview. Donald Trump at one point stopped the interview to try to get documents proving Joe Biden wants to abolish the police, which Joe Biden doesn't want to do. And Donald Trump was unable to prove with those documents he tried to get. Trump was sweating so badly that at one point it looked like flop sweat. He was glistening and dripping with sweat throughout the interview. Trump referred to World Wars one and two as beautiful, beautiful. Trump challenged Joe Biden to a cognitive test and accused the interviewer, Chris Wallace, of being unable to answer some of the test questions on the cognitive test. And that's like only the half of it. Trump has insulted people in interviews, but he was unhinged here. Trump has said dumb and wrong things in interviews, but Trump seemed impaired here. So let's get right down into it. Uh, uh, sit down. Join me in this adventure, which is really a horror show. The country can never allow something like this to happen again. It is historic in its level of insanity. I'm going to start with arguably one of the most deranged moments of the entire thing, which is that Chris Wallace shows Trump a poll about Trump versus Biden on mental soundness, which we'll talk about later. More people in the poll. It's a Fox News poll. More people think Joe Biden is mentally sound to be president than the number who think Trump is mentally sound. And Donald Trump starts saying not only can he do better than Biden on a cognitive test, it gets really ugly. And he actually says to Chris Wallace, I would do better than you. You would struggle to answer some of the questions on the cognitive test completely and utterly unhinged people who is more competent, who's got whose mind is sounder. Biden beats you in that. Well, I tell you what, uh, let's take a test. Let's take a test right now. Let's go down. Joe and I will take a test. Let him take the same test that I took. Incidentally, I took the test, too, when I heard that you passed it. Yeah. How did it's you not do the it? Hard, well, it's not the hardest test. No, but the it last has a picture and it's the last not, and it's an elephant. No, no, no. You see, that's all misrepresentation. Well, that's what it was on the web. It's all misrepresentation because, yes, the first few questions are easy. But I'll bet you couldn't even answer the last five questions. I'll bet you couldn't. They get very hard. The last five. Well, questions. one of them was count back from 100 by seven. And let me tell you. You couldn't answer. You couldn't answer. All right. What's the question? Many of the questions. I'd get you the test. I'd like to give it. But right. I guarantee you that Joe Biden could not answer those questions. Okay. okay? Uh, you, and you I answered about? all 35 questions correctly. We're clearly desensitized by more than three years of this because the president of the United States told the interviewer that the interviewer would be unable to do as well on a cognitive test meant to screen out dementia than the way Trump answered the questions. And it's like just a blip. Honestly, there were equally crazy things in this interview, never mind other things that happened this weekend. There are some real questions here, though, that, that I should mention. What test is Trump talking about? Because Trump talks about the 35 questions, the Montreal Cognitive Assessment, which is as far as we know what Trump took. And it was certainly what Chris Wallace was referring to. It doesn't have 35 questions. It's based out of 30 points. But we don't actually know what test Trump is referring to. Trump not e may not even remember the test itself. And as far as we knew, Trump took that test a year or two ago. But Trump recently said, I just took it. When was that and where? We're not aware of Trump being administered that or any other cognitive test recently. This was maybe the most mind numbingly bizarre moment of the interview. Then we get on to the Biden attacks here. Trump says Biden wants to defund the police. Joe Biden doesn't want to defund or abolish the police. And in fact, there's people on the left who are mad at Joe Biden because he doesn't want to defund or abolish the police. And Chris Wallace calls Trump on it. Trump stops the interview to try to get the proof that that's what Biden wants to do. Of course, it doesn't work that way because Biden doesn't want to abolish the police. Take a look. You've seen deaths up in New York, deaths up in Chicago, shootings. How do you explain it and what are you going to do about it? I explain it very simply by saying they're Democrat run cities. They're liberally run. They're stupidly run. Liberal Democrats have been running 
cities in this country for decades. Poorly. Why is it so bad right now? Uh, they've run them poorly. It was always bad, but now it's gotten totally out of control. And it's really because they want to defund the police. And Biden wants to fund, defund no, he, the police. Sir, he does not. Look, he signed a charter with Bernie Sanders. It Me says too, nothing with, about defunding the oh, police. Oh, really? It says abolish. It says defund. Let's go. All right. Well, get, me, you, get me the charter, please. All right. <laughs> so that led to a very interesting exchange where he had his staff go out and get the highlights from that 100-page compact that the Biden team and the Trump team, uh, rather the Biden team and the Sanders team, had signed. And he went through it, uh, and he found a lot of things that he objected to that Biden has agreed to, but he couldn't find any indication, because there isn't any, that Joe Biden has uh, sought to defund and abolish the police. Just amazing. I mean, lots of people wish Biden wanted to defund the police or abolish the police but he doesn't want to. And Chris Wallace fact checking Trump in real time there. Now, in a moment, I'm going to get to Chris Wallace more, more deeply. But for now, Wallace is at least doing the, the basic fact checking. Now, you'd think that after that bogus attack on Biden completely backfired, Trump wouldn't try another one. But he tries to suggest Biden will end religion in the United States. If Joe Biden is president, according to Trump, Joe Biden will end religion. Take a look. Him, we'll call religion will be gone. OK, life. You could forget about that. The whole question of life. Supreme you, you, when Court, you say life, you mean abortion. Absolutely. A hundred percent. That whole question, which is a very, you know, it's always been a 50 50 thing. It's actually trending a little bit more toward one when side. You say religion is going to be gone. What does that mean? Look at what they're doing to the churches. They won't let the churches even open if they want to stand in a field six feet apart. Now, I've said before, I don't care if a president is religious. I just want religion kept out of governance. That's secularism. Secular secularism isn't people can't be religious. It's in their role as as a public servant. Religion should play no role in that governance. But the facts happen to be Joe Biden's more religious than Donald Trump. I mean, it, it's not a preference. I don't care about presidential religiosity. But we know Trump is not religious and only pretends to be religious in order to appeal to evangelical voters. Trump might even be an atheist. I have a segment about this that I did a couple years ago. Joe Biden is a religious guy, and obviously religion will not be gone under Joe Biden. Just bungled bizarre claim after claim here by Donald Trump. At another point in the interview, Trump refers to World War One and World War Two as beautiful wars apropos of nothing. I mean, this was so, sort of like related to Confederate statues and monuments. And he throws in that that the, the wars were beautiful. And he also says, what are you going to name stuff after Al, Sh Al Sharpton or something? The National Defense Authorization Act, the NDAA, you have threatened to veto it because in the bill, and this is supported by Republicans as well as Democrats, it would rename army bases named for Confederate generals. Now, this is a bill that funds military operations. It gives the soldiers a pay raise. Yeah. You're going to veto no, that? because they'll get their pay raise. Hey, look, don't tell me this. I got soldiers, the biggest pay raises in the history of our, Understood. Of our military. I got soldiers, brand new equipment, brand new jets, brand new rockets, brand new 2.5 trillion. I did more for the military than any president that's ever had this office. Veto this because thing? I think that Fort Bragg, Fort Robert and Lee, all of these forts that have been named that way for a long time, decades and decades. But the military and says they're excuse for me. this. Excuse me. I don't care what the military says. I do. I'm, I'm supposed to make the decision. Fort Bragg is a big deal. We won two world wars. Nobody even knows General Bragg. We won two world wars. Go to that community where Fort Bragg is in a great state. I love that state. Go to Go to the community, say, how do you like the idea of renaming Fort Bragg? And then what are we going to name it? You're going to name it after the Reverend Al Sharpton? What are you going to name it, Chris? Tell me what you're going to name it. This is the interview version of a sort of a Rorschach test. It's like an ink blot. What do you see here? It's complete free association. And in terms of November, Chris Wallace gives Donald Trump the results of a new Fox News poll in which Biden is plus eight. We're going to look at that poll in detail later. And Trump just says, oh, it's all fake polling. Mr. President, you'll be happy to know that Fox News has a new poll out today and you're going to be the very first person to hear about it. In the national horse race, Joe Biden 
leads you by eight points, 49% to 41. That's, I think, three, four points slimmer than it was a, a month ago. And on the issues, people trust Biden more to handle the coronavirus by 17 points, on race relations by 21 points, and even on the economy, they trust Biden more by one point. I understand we still have more than 100 days to this election, but at this point, you're losing. First of all, I'm not losing because those are fake polls. They were fake in 2016, and now they're even more fake. The polls were much worse in 2016. They interviewed 22 percent Republican. Well, how do you do 22 percent Republican? You see what's going on. Uh, I have other polls that put me leading, and we have polls where I'm leading. I have a poll where we're leading in every swing state. Maybe I don't understand the Trumpist mentality, but it seems to me Trump could be prepared to answer these questions about polls in a more reasonable way. Like if I were Trump and of course I'm not Trump, if I was dealing with being down by double digits in most polls and I'm confronted about it, I don't say the polls are fake. I would say, listen, Chris, there's a reality right now. The country's in a tough place because of coronavirus. And as president, the buck stops with me. This is me pretending to, to be Trump, but be, but reasonable. I understand the frustration. I hear the frustration. My promise to you and to the American people is that between now and Election Day, I will do everything in my power to singularly focus on the virus, because dealing with the virus will help the economy. It will help education. It will help everything. What matters is polling in November, and I am going to leave no doubt in every American's mind that between now and November 3rd, they will see that I am pouring my life into resolving this situation. And in the end, they will see that I've earned a second term. Like, wouldn't that be more powerful than the polls are fake and I'm really winning? You can't trust the fake news media on the same topic. Trump asked uh, was asked whether he would accept the results of the upcoming election. Trump, of course, is losing in every poll, but things can change between now and November. And Trump is unwilling to say I will accept the results. And he says mail in voting could actually rig the election. You don't know until you see. It depends. I think mail in voting is is going to rig the election. I really do. Uh, Are you suggesting that you might not accept the results of the election? I have to say, look, Hillary Clinton asked me the same thing. No, I asked you the same no, no, thing in the debate. There is a tradition in this country. In fact, one of the prides of this country is the peaceful transition of power and that no matter how hard fought a campaign is, that at the end of the campaign, that the loser concedes to the winner, not saying that you're necessarily going to be the loser or the winner, but that the loser concedes to the winner and that the country comes together in part for the good of the country. Are you saying you're not prepared now to commit to that principle? What I'm saying is that I will tell you at the time. I'll keep you in suspense. Well, okay? Chris. And you know what? She's the one that never accepted I it. I agree. She never accepted her loss. And but she it, looks like can a you fool. Give a, can you give a direct answer? You will accept the election? I have to see. Look, you I have to see. No, I'm not going to just say yes. I'm not going to say no. And I didn't last time either. Remember that Trump doesn't realize that when we talk about vote by mail this year, all we're talking about is expanding absentee ballots for anybody. If they want an absentee ballot, they can they can uh, request one and get one. But Trump seems to not understand that and continues to refuse to say I will accept the election results. Then we get into coronavirus stuff. Trump wrongly claims that we have one of the lowest mortality rates in the world. That's not true. As I've shown you before, our deaths per capita are the 10th highest in the world. Chris Wallace calls Trump on it and the White House tried giving Chris a completely bogus chart. You're going to have to take a look at this more closely and we will talk about it after this. One that did the European Union very early. But when you talk about mortality rates, I think it's the opposite. I think we have one of the lowest mortality That's rates true, in the sir. world. We, well, we, we're going to we take have, a look. We had 900 deaths on a single day. We will this, take a look. This week. Ready? I, you, you can well, check it out. Could you please get me the mortality rate? Yeah. Kaylee's right here. I heard we had one of the lowest, maybe the lowest mortality I, rate anywhere in the world. Do you have the numbers, please? <laughs> because I heard we had the best mortality rate. The case rate of similarly situated countries, as uh, Dr. Burks points out, and this is... Number number one low mortality rate. Right? I hope you show the scenario because it shows what fake news is all about. Okay, okay go I don't ahead. think I'm fake news, but okay. I will put well, our there you are. we'll put our stats you on. You said we had the worst mortality rate in the world, I and we have the best. The all right, it's a little complicated, but bear with us. 
We went with numbers from Johns Hopkins University, which charted the mortality rate for 20 countries hit by the virus. The U.S. ranked seventh, better than the United Kingdom, but worse than Brazil and Russia. The White House went with this chart from the European CDC, which shows Italy and Spain doing worse, but countries like Brazil and South Korea doing better. So what's interesting about this is, do you believe Trump really is being told we have the lowest mortality rate? Like this is a very instructive clip because our deaths per capita are the 10th highest in the world. What the White House gave Fox is a chart of case fatality rates, which is death relative to testing, which is not informative here. But what's extra wild about this is Trump has admitted he wanted to slow down testing to keep case numbers low. The case fatality rate goes up if you keep case numbers low. So Trump's admitted strategy of trying to slow testing actually increases the case fatality rate, which isn't even the right measure. So this is like incompetence plus ignorance plus self-inflicted damage. And we're going to compare these metrics in an upcoming segment because I want to make sure that everybody sort of understands all, all of the different components to this. Now, in this next clip, here is dripping sweaty Trump asked about mask wearing. And he says, well, you know, masks cause problems, too. So definitely no national mask mandate. You wore a mask for the first time in public at Walter Reed this weekend. Question. The CDC says if everybody wore a mask for four to six weeks, we could get this under control. Do you regret not wearing a mask in public from the start? And would you consider Will you consider a national mandate that people need to wear masks? No, I want people to have a certain freedom, and I don't believe in that, no. And I don't agree with the statement that if everybody wear a mask, everything disappears. Hey, Dr. Fauci said don't wear a mask. Our Surgeon General, terrific guy, said don't wear a mask. Everybody was saying don't wear a mask. All of a sudden, everybody's got to wear a mask. And as you know, masks cause problems, too. With that being said, I'm a believer in masks. I think masks are good. Bottom line is the president said he is not going to issue a national mandate on masks. He's going to leave it up to the individual governors in their states. Now, what's funny here is Trump lists only reasons not to wear a mask, but says he still supports them. Like if he really believed, you know, Fauci said don't wear one, even though that's been explained. Adams said don't wear one, the Surgeon General, even though that's been explained and masks cause problems but I'm still in favor of them. That's weird in its own way. Like, why would you be in favor of something about which you can only name negatives and and uh, anti endorsements? It doesn't really make sense. And then we get to sort of this this kind of bombshell, except it's sort of hard to even believe. Chris Wallace brings up since coronavirus hit, some people have lost health insurance. People have lost jobs and their health insurance is tied to the job. So they lost health insurance. And he mentions, fortunately, we have the Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, and people are signing up for it. But you want to get rid of it. Why are you doing this now? And Trump claims that in two weeks there will be a completely brand new health care system to replace Obamacare. What? Yes. Take a listen. In history. I want to talk to you about Obamacare. Since the pandemic hit, millions of people have lost their jobs and thereby lost their health insurance. And almost a half a million have signed up for Obamacare. Your administration just announced that you're signing on to a lawsuit to overturn Obamacare and replace it. Why does it make sense to overturn Obamacare, with which people now are relying on? Democrats are going to say the man who's wanted to kill Obamacare is going to take away the protection for pre-existing conditions. First of all, we got rid of the individual mandate. Pre-existing conditions will always be taken care of by me and Republicans, 100 percent. But you've been in office three and a half years. You You don't have a plan. We haven't had Uh, Excuse me. You heard me yesterday. We're signing a health care plan within two weeks, a full and complete health care plan that the Supreme Court decision on DACA gave me the right to do. So we're going to solve. We're going to sign an immigration plan. Now, this interview was filmed a few days ago, so it's not two weeks from yesterday. According to when Trump said this, he says we are 10 days from a completely new health care plan. What's the plan? We don't know. Some Republicans must know about it, right? Somebody must know about if we're 10 days from a replacement to Obamacare, somebody must know about it. We've heard nothing about that at all from anybody that's been asked. And then here in closing, 
Trump attacks Fox News on Fox News. This was the start of the interview, in fact, which has sort of become a constant side story. Trump going after Fox News. But Chris Wallace basically asks if Trump understands journalism. Some people were surprised when you agreed to this interview to sit down with me. What are you going to ask? Especially because of some of the mean tweets that you've said about me. Mike Wallace wannabe, nasty and obnoxious. I will tell you, after that one, my son Peter, whom you've met, called and he said, nasty, no, obnoxious, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the question. One of your beefs seems to be that I put Democrats on the show and I ask them questions. And, and I guess the question I have is, don't you understand it's my job? to put Democrats on as well as Republicans and to ask them probing questions just like I asked Republicans? I'm not a big fan of Fox, I'll be honest with you. They've changed a lot since Roger Ailes. And I watch people like Swalwell, who I don't even know. He goes on the show. He got less than one percent. So Trump just doesn't get how journalism works. And in fact, there's very little journalism even happening on Fox, but the little of it that is happening, Trump hates. So. I mean, what do we make of this? This really is like nothing that we've ever seen. And my takeaway is anyone supporting this is no friend of ours. It just can't be like this has to stop. Even if you like low taxes or something and you consider yourself like a Mitt Romney fiscal conservative, you can't support this. You, you really can't. And this is um, uh, uh, we, we have to be getting to the end. One quick note about Chris Wallace. Chris Wallace has been praised as wow, Fox News host obliterate uh, host obliterates Trump and what a great job he did. Chris Wallace is no great hero, okay? Chris Wallace is playing softball when everyone else is playing T ball, so it looks like he's playing hard uh, hardball, right? In other countries, a president this incompetent wouldn't be able to do a single interview because they would all go far worse than this. It would be impossible for presidents in other countries based on how media will actually question presidents. Remember, Trump said during this interview, Hillary didn't accept the election results in 2016. What are you talking about? She immediately conceded and we barely heard from her for a year or longer. Um, Trump said Biden would turn us into Venezuela uh, and, and Chris Wallace said nothing. Now, I understand you can't. I've experienced this. You can't turn every misstatement into a fight. But the idea that this is some hardball interview from Chris Wallace, this is like a five out of 10. And it looks intense because just about every other interview is a one out of 10 or two out of 10 when Trump goes on Fox and Friends, when Trump goes on Hannity, et cetera. So let's not give Chris Wallace more praise than he deserves. Although let's be clear that in, in the Fox universe, this isn't too common. But remember, this plays into Fox's strategy of saying we have a diversity of views on our program. We have Chris Wallace who asks obvious journalistic questions and then we have everything else who who you know people just gushing about Donald Trump. Don't fall for the uh, gushing praise of Chris Wallace. Let me know your reaction to this. I'm on Twitter at dpackman. Privacy.com is one of our sponsors and they're giving you $5 just for using their free service at privacy.com slash Pacman. Privacy is a service I've been using for a while now. I love it. It saves me a bunch of headaches. It's completely free and it's very quick to set up. And here's how it works. When you pay for something online or over the phone, instead of exposing your real credit card number, privacy lets you generate virtual card numbers. The payments are withdrawn from your checking account, but your real card number stays completely private and you do it all with one click. You can autofill the card number in your web browser on the phone. You can create 12 virtual cards a month. You can set spending limits, freeze them, delete them whenever you want. I especially love it for free trials where you need to give a credit card number because I can destroy the virtual card number as soon as I give it to the company and I know I won't be charged in the future. If you're ordering food over the phone, why do I need to give a restaurant my real card number? I don't have to. Companies don't have to know who you are. Your real credit card number is protected from the data breaches that happen, unfortunately, more often than we would like. And it's completely free. They do have a paid version with different tiers where you can create more virtual credit card numbers per month, cashback rewards, extra security features. But go ahead and sign up for the free service. It's a no brainer. Companies can't charge you unexpectedly. You're protected from identity theft. It costs you nothing. And privacy is giving you $5 to spend just for signing up 
when you go to privacy.com slash Pacman. 